thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, John, thanks for having me. My pleasure. So I'd like to jump into it and talk about your climb, your journey, how you got here. Sure, yes. Well, we, you know, I'm an intellectual property lawyer by training, a lot of background in helping clients in lots of industries um, manage brand protection, trademarks that go along with that, copyright issues. And I just started working um, with a lot of marketers as a natural sort of progression of having um, some experience in those areas of the law and really, really enjoyed working with marketers. I love the ingenuity. I love the creativity. Um, and so we started really targeting marketers in general for our work and then adding more services relative to marketing law specifically. So our firm helps today helps independent marketing, advertising, design, um, digital agencies, well, not only with intellectual property protection and monetization, but also with marketing law questions such as influencer marketing or data privacy or putting together those important master service agreements and independent contractor relationships. So from IP, to marketing marketers to agencies and then adding on just some more services that that community needs in general so that's kind of how we that's the thirty thousand foot description of um my trajectory i guess into representing agencies at the firm did you start out in just like traditional business law and then you're like wait these these people obviously need a ton of my help like what did what did that look like i did what i think a lot of uh, lawyers do when they hang a shingle, which is really what it was in the days when I got my initial start. I, I started my career in a big law firm. Um, and when I decided to launch on my own, um, which was kind of a decision made for me by the economy at the time, um, I had a basically general business practice and, and I represented individuals. We did a little of everything. And when I say we, I mean me. Uh, it was me, my office and a desk and, you know, uh, not much more than that. And it's a pretty humble beginning, to be honest with you. Um, and I partnered up with another attorney after a couple of years, and we had a firm focused really on general small business. Um, and it was regional. Um, I'm based in Ohio, and we worked with Northeastern Ohio clientele in multiple industries. But what made us unique is we did have this intellectual property background, which not a lot of small firms had at the time. So worked um, to build that firm out, added some other partners and capabilities and services, um, exited that firm. Actually, I turned the lights out on that firm. Both of my partners retired, um, one to leave the law entirely um, and do something else. Um, actually both to do entirely different things professionally. Um, and then one partner had a health scare. So her retirement got a delayed a little bit. So I anyway, shut the lights out on that firm. I was the last partner standing. We made sure the clients got taken care of. Um, and I joined another partnership, which was kind of a bigger version of that firm, but still focused on entrepreneurial companies, um, small businesses in a region. And uh, five years ago, I decided to, um, take my um, knowledge base and relationship base in the marketing services industry and launch a firm designed just to meet their needs. So that's kind of been the trajectory from when I started to now. And uh, I have found that it's way more satisfying and uh, also uh, easier to help clients when you are going narrow and deep than when you're trying to um, sort of be all things to all people. And I think, you know, for whatever agency leaders or business leaders that might be listening to this right now, uh, I think that strategy holds for agencies um, in particular. And it's certainly the case for our agency clients. We just talked about that yesterday. Yeah. If you want higher margins and you want more efficiencies and you enjoy the work, then it definitely makes sense to, to niche focus. It does. And it helps also, it helps you be, it frees you up. To, it, it may feel confining. Um, and, you know, don't get me wrong for agencies who've been more general and they're and more broad and their client base, it can feel a little scary to turn away what feels like a sure thing. But 
what you find as you start um, targeting a particular community of clients, whether that's a vertical um, or whether it's clients that need a specific technical skill that your agency might have, it actually frees you up to be more creative because it's easier to think about other things that they need that you can help them with and earn money providing to them. So I, I think it's more liberating um, rather than confining to, um, to niche. And, um, you know, in my case, it was really a, the niche is really a cross section between a few areas of the law and a particular industry that needs the help. Um, but for an agency, it could be, you know, it could be anything. It could be a particular industry. Like I said, a particular technical competency. Um, we've just, in the years I've been doing this and working with agencies, the ones who stake that um, position just tend to be more profitable, um, have better margins and have more fun. Yeah. There's another school of thought about that, you know, that you're limiting your ability to be creative. And then if you work in a vertical, it's, it's stifling to the imagination. I've heard all those arguments. I don't particularly buy them. Um, but I think that's a decision every, every business owner has to make for themselves. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and to that, I mean, if you're working on HVAC companies all day, then that could be a little bit soul training, right? Because it's just, you know. I think it depends. I mean, maybe, yeah, maybe no. I mean, maybe you, you market for HVAC companies, but then maybe you build out, um, you know, maybe you build out a marketing education arm where you're creating products to help them market themselves or, Maybe you're developing a turnkey system that you can sell to multiple HVAC companies in multiple non-competing markets across the United States. And you're making money selling the same thing over and over again. And then maybe that leads to other services. So I think it's actually, um, it induces creativity, but I think it's all in the way you look at it and you know what really lights you up about the business. I, I have a particular bias towards agencies monetizing their IP. I don't think they do enough of it. I think agencies, in my experience, tend to undervalue the intellectual property that they create. And they've got all this stuff sort of swept into the corners of their agency that they haven't, um, either a client has rejected or it's something that they did on spec for a pitch and you know the relationship didn't come to fruition. If you own all that stuff, um, take a look at what you created and see what kind of juice you can squeeze out of it. Um, and the pandemic has really created more of an interest than I have ever seen since I've been working um, representing agencies and, and saying, how else can we create revenue streams? What else do we have here? What else have we created that we can deliver to sort of um, add some additional ways that we can make money while our clients are recovering and getting you know their feet on the ground again for our traditional service offerings? So say, so say more about that, the, the things that agencies could monetize that they're not. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think, I think one of the things I just said earlier is an example of that. Um, you know, probably one of the clearest examples I can think of is if you have a creative competency in a particular industry and you've got spec creative or you've got sort of... Um, industry knowledge or strategic recommendations that are consistently helpful and profitable for your clients. Can you export that into either a course or a turnkey, um, you know, marketing system that you can license um, to multiple clients in that industry and markets that don't compete with each other? Um, that's recurring passive revenue or as close to passive as you can get in a services business. Um, Maybe you are able to um, create a technology based upon the needs that you see um, clients in your target market having. And so that's a product. Um, perhaps you can conduct proprietary research uh, about an industry and sell the results of that research to multiple parties who wanna learn about how to sell into that industry. Um, that's, a, that's a way to generate revenue on a passive basis. So. What I found is that agencies over the years have typically, you know, their perspective is, yeah, that's nice, but that's not really our bread and butter. And that's not the first way we think about making money in the morning. Uh, and our clients need us and they're very demanding and we have deadlines, et cetera, et cetera. 
all true, but when things got a little bit quieter um, this past year for some agencies, we saw a little bit more interest, particularly in the digital course creation um, uh, and virtual event creation um, spaces. A lot of agencies, if they have an expertise in a particular um, you know, area would create um, virtual events or summits um, and generate income that way. Um, because you don't have the expense of, you know, actually creating a live conference, right? It's, it's, it's not without its challenges. It's not easy to well, execute an event like that easily, but um, doing things like that, uh, creating products, creating a do, creating do-it-yourself systems that they can sell. So all that's IP and it's all licensable and it's all brandable and um, agencies are perfectly positioned um, to, to earn revenue or add to their revenue that way. So that's, that's really what I mean when I say monetizing your IP. Appreciate that. And how, 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 how would you, or how does one help agencies protect their IP? There's, you know, there are multifaceted things an agency needs to think about when it comes to protecting its intellectual property. At the first instance, is the new business situation. When agencies are in the business either of responding to requests for proposal or information, or if they are, if you're still an agency that does pitching, uh, we see much, much less of that these days than there used to be. But if you're an agency that pitches, um, or if you are going to put together just a really detailed proposal in your business development efforts, all those situations lead to you exposing your ideas and your, and sometimes, um, you know, creative assets that incorporate those ideas to somebody who hasn't actually engaged you to be their client yet or paid you a dime yet. So that's the first instance where you need to really think about protecting your intellectual property uh, in the form of um, a non-disclosure agreement, if it's appropriate between the parties, um, with carefully crafted language in your proposals and on your sample assets about who owns those. Um, and just with good conversations between the parties about the agency owning the rights and everything it's exposing and suggesting um, unless the parties come to an agreement otherwise. So that's kind of the first you know, cut of really being concerned about protecting your IP. Once you're in the client relationship, you know, you've, um, you've successfully dated and you're married, um, your agencies are selling IP every day. That is that is basically what an agency does. And I know they don't always look at it that way, but whether you're creating strategy or whether you're doing creative um, or any of the other millions of things that agencies can do to help their clients achieve a specific business result, it's all IP creation. And usually the parties intend that the client own the, uh, the intellectual property or the work at the end of the day. That's great. But as an agency, you want to make sure you've got control over when those rights are being transferred. And you don't want to transfer the rights until you've been paid. So there are IP ownership considerations in the actual contract, in the relationship. And if you look at talent, um, it's a no-brainer who owns the rights to the work that your employee creates for you as an agency. Um, it belongs to you. Um, under the copyright law, but most agencies work with contractors these days. They they staff up or they staff down with freelance help. And um, IP ownership for those relationships needs to be expressed in a written agreement. Um, or you find yourself as an agency not owning work that you've already paid for in some circumstances. And a lot of agencies don't get that because it doesn't really seem commercially reasonable. But um, if your contractor or your freelancer doesn't sign an agreement with you saying you're going to own the rights to the work that they do, you don't own the rights to the work that they do. Um, you may have license, uh, but you're, you're not going to be in the position you want to be in. And worse, you're not going to be in a great position with your client because you can't give to them what you don't own in the first place. So sort of a chain of title question when it comes to working with contractors then agencies and their clients. So, so it comes up in a myriad of ways. And th those are just the daily business transactional things that create IP consequences. That's not even um, considering the whole, you know, monetize your IP and create new revenue streams discussion that we just had. Yeah. So I, I'm a, a marketer and uh, a sales professional, right? We'll, yeah. we'll say that. 
Um, and when I think of all the legal things, I instantly, I to me, it seems like it's going to muddle and slow down the sales process, right? Mm -hmm. So coming at it from that angle, when let's say we don't have in there the, the license agreement based on working with a client, what does what does the court look at? Is it typically, is it, do they favor the agency side based on those circumstances or do they favor the company or is it just a coin flip? Well, so if you're asking if the, if the agency and the client end up um, in some sort of challenge or disagreement mm-hmm. once the relationship started, um, it can depend on a lot of things. It's hard. It's a hard question to answer in a vacuum. Um, to the extent you do have anything in writing, obviously, that expression is going to going to govern whatever happens on those points. If there's issues you haven't addressed in writing, then in most cases, um, a, a fact finder, the court, is going to look at how have you been doing business with each other. Um, what are the What are the communications between the parties say? How did you both act? How did you both um, so the, the differences can vary greatly in results. Um, we have a point of view about this that you want to eliminate as many of the variables as possible by being proactive and putting some process in place up front. So there are as few questions later about the party's intent as possible. Um, You want to sort of, and and having a good process in place as an agency, having your own set of templates, having your own um, set of policies and procedures around how we handle legal matters. And it doesn't have to be anything that's scarily complicated um, or expensive. It can be as simple as this is the set of documents we use when we engage a client, when we get a freelancer. Uh, when we work with another agency to serve as a common client. These are the documents we use. If you're going to vary from those documents, there need to be good reasons why, and here are some of them. Um, Then it's, these are the people who handle the legal issues in our agency. And it may just be one woman or one guy. It just, I mean, if you're small, let's be honest, you don't have a legal department. Um, and that wouldn't be a good use of your resources to have a legal department because you don't have a, a, a need that often. But I'm talking about centralization. So it's process and centralization, meaning the same people handle these things, not this account manager handles the contract for this client. And then this account exec handles it for this client. And the documents look nothing like each other at the end of the day. Um, so having some process in place about what happens here, what happens here can save you so much time and money down the road that this doesn't have to be overwhelming for your agency um, if you're small. And so I think agencies are fearful of adding a lot of drag to the process, particularly with new business, as you mentioned, with sales. Um, they don't wanna put a non-disclosure agreement in front of a prospect because it sets the wrong tone. It doesn't. My experience is it absolutely does not set the tone. As a matter of fact, it sets the table really well um, for the agency, in my experience, because it makes you look sophisticated about the way you value your own worth and the relationship. Um, It's going to look aggressive if we give them a contract that's more than two pages long and addresses some of these things like liability, intellectual property. Again, I disagree. Um, We've I've conducted hundreds of client contract negotiations for agencies and the client is never, I've never seen a client walk away from a deal because the contract that the agency put on the table was too aggressive. Is it the contract they end up signing at the end of the day? Probably not. There's probably some negotiating that goes on back and forth and some things survive and some things get cut out or the agency signs the client agreement. Even in that case, you still want to have your own version of a client contract so that you look like you're prepared and that you understand your leverage um, and that you have a baseline to know how to negotiate. Um, If you're going to work with an enterprise size company and you're a 20 person agency, um, yeah, there's a good likelihood you may sign the client's MSA, but that doesn't mean you're not going to negotiate some things out of it that don't make sense for you as an agency. So I just think... um, I think there's an overestimation of the amount of friction that this causes in the sales process. 
Does it slow it down a little bit? It might, but it's it's commonly understood to be just uh, a normal part of putting together the relationship. And you'll never have more leverage as an agency than you do at the beginning. So use it. Use it to um, to put agreements in place that are fair to everybody and that um, protect the agency's interest um, in the client relationship. So what would you say the scenario is, let's say, in, you know, from the beginning of the sales process to, you know, getting the, you know, client onboard engagement, what does that look like from a legal document perspective? I think it depends upon the way you um, came about the opportunity as an agency. If, for example, you are um, responding to an RFP or an RFQ, then um, it's really about the documents that you submit in response to that request and what language you include in them regarding confidentiality, regarding intellectual property ownership. If you're pitching, um, it's probably gonna look like um, an NDA uh, first. And you know, you you explain to the client, this is a mutually protective document. We're not storming in here as an agency only interested in protecting our stuff. This is to protect you, the client too. And a lot of times clients require the NDA anyhow, before you get started having the new business conversation. That's cool. Sign that one if you want to, just make sure it's mutual. Just make sure it's protecting the agency's IP and ideation just as much as it's protecting the client's information. So I have no issue um, with you signing the client's version of that document as long as it's mutual. Um, so it probably looks like that in a pitch situation. Um, if you are, um, let's see, what other ways are there that you might come in front of a business opportunity? You're responding to a quote, oh, a proposal. You're writing a proposal to um, seek an opportunity or because you've been asked to. Um, again, it comes down to what language do you include in that document um, regarding the ideation you're gonna put in there. If you're writing a really detailed, which I would caution you to think twice about doing, if you're writing a detailed strategic proposal, um, ask yourself whether you're giving away a little bit too much um, in the proposal document, first of all. But if you're putting some strategy in there, um, you know, you put the disclaimers and the ownership language in there in a friendly, non confrontational way, um, along with your statement um, of understanding that this is the property of the agency until the clients agree, you know, until the parties agree otherwise. So, really, just depends how you start um, the conversation, what documents and tools you might need. And then let's say, so it's an NDA and then you do master services agreement and then you do like the individuals. Can you explain what that looks like? Sure. So let's say you've um, secured a piece of business. So you've signed the MSA after you've negotiated that. Um, hey, we need a specialist on, um, you know, influencer marketing. So we don't want to staff up for this position full time. We're going to engage these two contractors. So it is a matter of making sure that you have a, a solid independent contractor agreement in place, which is going to give you um, ownership of the rights and the work that those contractors create for you. Um, it should also address issues like non-solicitation. Um, you want to make sure that if you're exposing a contractor to the agency's client, that you're not giving them the ability to, um, to connect to work directly um, and exclude the agency from that opportunity. So non-solicitation language is appropriate. Um, and also confidentiality, sort of the things you might expect of a vendor that you were hiring. Um, that's the next um, stage in the process. And typically that combination of documents and processes um, is going to be productive in just about all situations. There, you know, there are runoffs here and there. I'll tell you, publicity rights is um, a big issue that has to be negotiated in all those agreements. And what I mean by that, sort of a subset of IP rights. Um, publicity rights mean the ability to display samples of the work that you've done for your clients in your promotional portfolio. So the way that might emerge with an agency is the agency wants to put a case study, for example, on its website uh, regarding some of the work that it's done. You need to make sure you have the right to do that um, 
because at that point the client owns the work, right? Because you've been paid conceivably. So you need to either, depending on what your contract says, you need to either need to ask them for permission um, or if you've been fortunate, to, we try to negotiate these rights up front that you've got publicity rights for promotional purposes. But if you haven't, you've got to ask them um, or they may just have a pro, some enterprises just have a prohibition on your ability um, to do that. So you need to carry that through with your independent contractors. You don't want an independent contractor putting samples of work they did for your agency's client and their capabilities um, portfolio um, because it might put you in breach as an agency of your contract. Um, and even if you're not in breach, it's not going to be a comfortable conversation. Plus, it positions that client as a client of the contractor and not of the agency. And that may not at all be your intention. So. Mm -hmm another IP issue to consider. Yeah, no, and, I, and, I, and I've seen that where there was somebody that an agency white labeling for another agency and then one of their contractors posted that information and it was like, how does this even connect here? This yep. entire chain where the client yeah. did have a prohibition on it. It's a fair question. I mean, and, and what, since you mentioned that, you know, strategic alliance relationships between agencies and they can look they can look different. It can be a pure, I'm going to refer, you know, you do digital and we do social. And so um, we're going to, we're going to gauge you when our clients need digital. Um, and there's going to be some revenue share of that work, or it can be, you know, we're hiring you to basically position yourselves as our digital team. I mean, we've told, I don't recommend a lack of transparency on this point with the client, by the way, because it never works out well, but you're basically going to function as our digital team on this project because we don't have that capability. So you can, I mean, if you've been following the bouncing ball so far, you can see how that creates some of the same issues that you'd create with an independent contractor in terms of client ownership, confidentiality, IP ownership, et cetera. What do you think about agencies, and this is coming from my personal experience, putting together their own contracts based on templates that they see online? It's interesting that you ask the question. Um, I think it depends where the source material comes from. Um, we're actually in the process of developing a subscription-based service to help agencies um, have regular access to the, a library of the kind of templates that they use most frequently in their day-to-day -day business interactions. Um, and in our case, these are going to be materials that have been vetted and prepared by a firm that's worked in this space for an, a lot of years and negotiated hundreds of these um, agreements and things. So I think it matters where you get the information that you're using as the basis for um, your own documents. Um, I'm not a fan of sort of the legal mills out there that are not um, industry focused. I don't, I think it's very easy to misconstrue the complexity of the agency business relationships um, with its, its clients, its partners, its employees, its contractors, um, because this really, it really is a hybrid of the typical kind of small business issues that any services firm could face. You know, you've got employment law issues, you've got real estate issues, you've got corporate law issues. That's really, I think, what most of the legal mills out there, like the legal zooms of the world, are there to, um, to fill a gap for. And there's, there are good reasons why those services are um, there to fill a gap when it comes to access to justice, when it comes to access to um, reasonably priced tools and services. But if your agency is, if, if you're in a very specific industry, I think that if you're going to get a source online, it should be from a place um, that understands how you do business and what your business is like. Um, so that's my perspective on that. I guess along those lines, what's the worst situation you've seen an agency get into by not having, you know, the proper documents in place? Well, we've definitely seen debates about 
I can maybe help you with this, right? So I had a project where in our documents, I can't remember what it said at the time. This was seven, eight years ago. Uh, we essentially had to continue work up to a certain point where when we totaled it all out after like the year and a half we were working on that project, it was like hundreds of thousands of dollars were lost, mm. right? And because the other guy was uh, an attorney, he said like, because of this, you have to do this. I had another attorney look at it like, yeah, and you're going to go to war fighting for this essentially. So, um, and then by the time we totaled everything out, that's what it cost. So that would be one of my worst legal situations running into it. So I didn't know if you run into similar things based on agreements where it's like, yeah, somebody has it, you have to finish that project. Well, was it legal or was it just a function of, of scope creep that ended up eating away at all the margin and the profit? Yeah, it was it was scope creep to the point where our understanding of what we thought was agreed on wasn't amicable based on my it wasn't amicable, right? We, we agreed on two different things. Um, right. But the document said otherwise, which favored his expectation. Right. Yeah, I mean, I guess my reaction to that would be um, this is these the documents you assign with clients are very modular, right? You want you want an overall document that's got your overall legal um, terms and conditions in it. And then you want something specific as to the work that you're doing. And, you know, some relationships last a long time and they encompass a number of projects. And so you want a different SOW for each of those projects. Uh, but to answer your question, we've had <laughs> we've had a ton of scenarios. I don't know how to I don't know how to categorize them in terms of better. Okay, I'll give you one example. We had an agency that engaged a freelancer to help them with some brand identity projects for two of their clients. Um, actually, two freelancers, neither of whom were um, US based, and who then later found out that the um, one freelancer, two other artists, the freelancer had plagiarized logos that ultimately ended up in the identity systems of two different clients. So we had to um, find the original artists, negotiate the purchases of the artwork after the fact, um, transfer the rights to that artwork to the agency so then they could quickly paper and transfer the rights to the client, which, and you can just imagine the behind the scenes level of stress for an agency owner who wants to fix this before he or she has to tell their client that this was an issue. So that was kind of a crazy one. Um, we have had agency client debates over exclusivity, which is becoming an increasingly thorny topic between clients and agencies. And I, I'll be candid and say it's um, a potential hazard or consequence of niching. If you're gonna go deep and narrow, you're eventually um, gonna do some really good work. It's gonna put you on the radar of competitors of your current clients and they're gonna wanna hire you and your current clients may not love that. And so you have to work through that and the contracts are one of the ways that you do that. So we've had a number of dicey situations there. A lot of dicey situations with portfolio displays, whether it's client calling agency saying, hey, we didn't say you could put our logo or as case study on your website or submit this in an awards competition or the agency having to call the contractor to say, this isn't your work. This is work we engaged you to do for our client and it doesn't belong on your portfolio site, especially if you're not even gonna acknowledge us um, you know, in the post. So it's, you know, fortunately we take a proactive approach in our counseling of agencies. And so um, I'm, I'm happy to say we've never really had a business ending um, conflict that we've had um, to help our clients resolve. Uh, they, we tend to nip things really early in the bud if there is a problem or prevent them in the first place. And that's my philosophy really about how agencies should work with their professional advisors, especially legal advisors. Nobody wants to spend money on legal services. No agency owner went into the agency business wanting to think about legal stuff. They just it's not a sexy part of your business. It's not the part of the business that lights you up. And I get it. 
Um, so work with a partner that helps you avoid trouble. Um, and it can cost more money up front to put all this process and structure in place. Um, but the hassle, the time, the lost opportunity and the money that it's going to save you over time um, is going to make it you know, well worth it. And that's our philosophy. And the agencies who we work with um, are the ones that are comfortable you know, working that way as well. What should an agency expect to budget, let's say starting out if they want to get everything set up for the year um, and you can give like ranges or whatnot, and then, you know, yearly to make sure that they're protected, you know, as far as their IP is concerned. Right. You know, I think up at the beginning to get a good tool set of customized agreements and processes and policies for your agency, you could spend anywhere um, from three to $10,000, depending on um, how, you know, how you stage the work. And I know that seems like a lot, but when you think about the average value of a client contract that could go sideways, um, you know, and you, the idea is you amortize the investment you make in this process over a number of relationships and situations over the year. So I would say, you know, from three to 10, which I know feels like a big range, but it just depends on um, how broad the agency's experience is. And then thereafter, I, you know, I say easily forecast you need to spend, I don't know, anywhere from say three to $7,000 a year on a combination of just business affairs type legal stuff, contract reviews, contract negotiations, um, IP counseling, you know, if you're a branding agency, for example, trademark reviews and things before you pitch potential brands to clients. Um, so, you know, if you look at it that way and you build it into your budget on a monthly basis so that you're basically setting aside, um, those resources and I, you know, I would say it's pretty much in alignment with what you need to forecast to spend on good, um, bookkeeping or tax planning or accounting on an annual basis. It's really, it's a job that never, um, is completely done because you're always facing new situations that require either a tweak to something you might already have in place or a fresh start, a fresh approach, um, and a new document. Speaking of the documents the, that would be prepared is, do I still need to have a disclaimer in the bottom of my email signature? Is that something that's necessary today? <laughs> you know, I, i I'm going to be the lawyer here and say it depends. I think if you are an agency that works with clients in a highly regulated industry, healthcare, financial services, banking, you want to mirror the way they communicate with the outside world. And so it's probably in your best interest to be a little bit more verbal in your disclaimers. Um, otherwise, you know, if you're doing the right things about privacy, um, if you're handling information in a compliant manner, then there's no technical requirements about what your confidentiality notice looks like. So, um, you know, we're seeing fewer and fewer of them, frankly, these days, but I still say, you know, match your approach to the approach of your client industry. Got it. And then like with that, do you do like a, a deep dive analysis on an agency to say like, all right, look, you are at high risk because of, you know, that, that, that. Yes. Well, we, we perform what we call legal audit. Um, and there's a couple different levels um, at which you can do this. We are a Full legal audit will be an attorney on our team actually working with the agency to have them collect the legal tools they're, they're currently using. We do a complete and thorough dive with them through all the documents. And the deliverable there from the audit is a set of recommendations about what we've observed in the documents, whether the document needs to be modified or whether they just need a new document to serve the same function. So that's our full audit. Um, we're gonna be introducing sort of an abbreviated version of, of that called a strategy session, which is really gonna be um, kind of a done with you. Um, we'll send you some information to gather, um, to, some questions to answer and a list of information to gather. We'll get on the phone um, with you for about an hour and review and just do a quick analysis 
Um, so that's our, our audit strategy session. Um, but yeah, we've, we are, and then, you know, we, all, we have a free checklist available actually um, off of our website um, and off of our legal toolkit website that you can download. And actually it's sort of a self-examination. It's a list of things to look for and think about in your own agency. Um, so it's a quick, you know, first start um, and you can get that. Um, you can drop that in the notes. I'll give you the link for that, but either at um, legalandcreative.com or agencylegalprotection.com. Perfect. And I guess where is that line between somebody knowing, you know, what they can do on their own versus when they need to hire you? Like, it, it seems fuzzy. I know a lot of people that they've actually done a really good job with their contract. So it appears, right? Right. Right. Well, I think it's a function of what was your starting point? I am a real believer in creating evergreen tools um, for our clients to use. And so if the base you were starting with um, was decent um, and you're paying attention and being consistent in how you handle um, you know, updating the documents, then there's no reason why you or a designated member, a designated member of your team, remember centralization, not everybody, somebody. Um, could modify those on a case-by-case -case basis. So I think it depends on the quality of your starting point, but absolutely. If you have a good quality starting point, then um, the you should invest in tools that are gonna be evergreen and you should be asking your advisor about that, um, your legal counsel about that. Is this something that I can use on a repeat basis with some minor modifications? Um, and even ask them to explain to you, you know, what you might need to know about whether to modify and how to modify. So I, I'm, I'm not averse to that approach if you're starting from a quality point. Yeah, yeah. A high word. quality point, yeah. yeah. yeah quality point. Yeah. The, so when it comes to content, I, um, far as I understand, you do a lot with like social media, understanding you know the content, the IP, and then there's, you know, the, the editorial distinction, right? So let's say somebody wanted to use editorial photos that are in Shutterstock or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. Is an agency or a client's blog considered editorial or is that commercial? It's commercial. It's absolutely commercial. I mean, when you're putting content out in pursuit of um, demonstrating your capabilities for potential new business or even developing thought leadership in the pursuit of new business. Um, it's not journalistic, it really is um, commercial. And this is, you know, I'm glad you raised this because this is a concept that uh, can be challenging to understand. There's a lot of misinformation out there about the topic, about the concept of fair use under the copyright law. What's fair to use, what's fair use? Um, fair use is a very limited, defense to a claim of copyright infringement. It doesn't apply in a, any commercial situation. So there's never been a time when a client has had a problem with misuse of somebody else's photography, videography, graphics, um, where fair use has been helpful to them. <laughs> In my experience, um, it is intended for situations like academia, um, use of work for which the copyrights have expired because it's so old or works that can't be protected by copyright. Um, it's extremely limited, way more limited than most people understand it to be. And your um, baseline assumption as an agency professional should be that it is never fair use. And that's what you should be telling your team members. If you're using stock services, you need to make sure you're acquiring the right licenses. You need to be having conversations with your clients about who's gonna buy the license and whose name the license is gonna be purchased. Cause that ends up causing a lot of misunderstandings when an agency acquires a license to use an image and then somebody in house at the client ends up reusing that image in some other, some other thing. Like maybe it was used in a website and then they wanna use it, I don't know, on a print piece or vice versa. Um, use only licensed um, material or material that you've commissioned and have written permission or ownership of um, and have very clear swim lanes about who's going to be responsible for, for getting those licenses. And then somebody needs to track them 
How broad are they? What's the extent of the, of the use that you're allowed to make of that work? Um, is it time limited? Is it limited by medium? Uh, is it limited by geography? Some licenses are limited you know, by country. So you just really, and again, centralization can really help you here because somebody can be keeping track of all that um, at the agency. Or if you don't want to be responsible, then you have a discussion with the client about um, putting the responsibility on them. So some of the hardest conversations I've had to have with agencies are when they completed this gorgeous piece of work and it includes scores of imagery or other protected works that nobody's taken the time to um, research the provenance of or get a license to use. And, they, and you've got a total copyright infringement situation on your hands if you release that work to the world. So you either have to take your chances or, which I don't recommend, or you start over again, or you reach out and get the permissions and the licenses, which is you know not the end of the world, but will cost you time and money. And if you're in a hurry, it's not gonna be welcome news to your client. What does that research process look like? And does somebody hire your company to do that? Research in terms of the, the image, providence. Right? Uh, yeah. yeah, we yeah we do. We've done copyright audits for works where we, um, you know, we look at the source of where the client found the work um, and determine. And and usually, a, these days especially, a client can really quickly tell you where the image was sourced, whether it's something that was scraped off of Google Images as a thumbnail, um, or whether they popped it in as a thumbnail sample from one of the, um, the licensed houses, you know, like a Shutterstock or get, you know, and, and I will, you know, not for nothing, the enforcement of this stuff is all machine driven and robotic these days. So it can be a couple of years before your client realizes that they've got an image on their website that isn't properly licensed and they're getting a demand from Getty. Oh yeah. Um, I, 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 <laughs> in a I couple of years, years they're ago. like $5,000 for an image that there's not an approvable license for. And guess what? Your best result in those cases is only going to be maybe getting the license fee down, but somebody's paying something. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you know, training, Training your creative team on this is really important because they're likely to be digital natives. They're likely not to understand fair use. They're not as likely to realize that just because you can scrape something from the internet um, doesn't mean that you can put it into work that you're selling <laughs> to your client. So, and they really literally just do not, they were not trained in this and they've grown up with a screen in their hand. So it's sort of illogical to them. So you've got to have a lot of conversations and in internal training um, about how to manage this and what the rules are. What about when it comes to like client social media? Let's say a client wants to talk about the Super Bowl on their Facebook page and they use those words which are owned by the NFL. Like where does that land? Is that something they should just call the big game like they do in their ads when they can't get permission? Yeah, if you can't get permission, then you need to think of a creative synonym for um, the thing you're referring to. The, yeah, as, as you and I are talking right now, it's the world's getting ready for the Super Bowl in a couple of weeks. Fucking airs, so, baby. Woo! <laughs> oh, my Cleveland Browns. They did so well this year. They, they were did. So yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you've got to you've got to be in a position and as an agency partner, you know, I get this, I get this question a lot. Yeah, you know, well, why should it be our legal liability or responsibility to sort through all this stuff for the client? That's it's their brand, it's their this is true, but do you really want to be their partner in creating or releasing work into the world that has a a, a legal problem that your client's gonna be left having to sweep up? So be a good partner and again proactiveness and in avoiding some of these things by doing some due diligence with them or having the conversation at least up front with them about the due diligence so they can get their legal teams involved on the client side um, to avoiding um, you know having a problem and that comes up frequently um, and it can be a point of negotiation in the contract between the agency and the client as well as who's going to handle legal review and approval um, but you want 
constant stream of communication back and forth about who needs to legally approve this, who needs to do the legal due diligence, who needs to manage licenses, who needs to do trademark screenings, you know, the whole thing. So it's it's definitely something that is in, mo with any enterprise client, it will be addressed in your master service agreement. Um, with all other clients, it's at least a conversation your teams should be having in a proactive way. What what is a healthy master services agreement look like in so far as length and number of pages? That's a hard question to answer. It really is a function of how you put your deals together. I mean, I like a modular approach to master service agreements where in and, and really there's I, in my mind two fundamental ways to document the agency client relationship. For those longer term, larger dollar ongoing relationships between the parties. You want a master service agreement that sort of governs overall the legal way you're gonna operate with each other. And then for each project you do um, with the client, you want a statement of work that incorporates the master services agreement, right? So that's for those larger dollar, longer term, bigger engagements. If you're an agency that also does quick pop, low dollar projects, um, you know, projects that don't take as long to do, then it's a good practice to perhaps use an estimate or a proposal and incorporate your standard legal terms and conditions right into that document in a shorter form. Um, you're assuming a lot less risk. The, the money involved is a lot more nominal um, and the parties are usually quicker to want to get past the contracting discussion. So um, with that sort of overall context, you asked about ideal length. I don't have an answer about ideal length and I don't, I'm going to be candid, react well when agency owners are super fixed on how long their contracts are. I don't want it any longer than X pages. It should be as long as it needs to be or as short as it needs to be to cover everything that needs to protect the agency. Um, so on average, I would say a master service agreement is anywhere from I don't know. I, I hesitate to give you a range because I'm thinking, I'm imagining agency owners charging to their lawyers saying, she said it shouldn't be longer than, I'm going to give you just a general idea. If it's longer than 10 pages, there should be a good reason for that. Okay. So 10 or under pages. There's lots of reasons why you could get it done in less than that, but that's the MSA. Plus you have the statement of work on top of that. So there you go. Dozen pages total, maybe. <laughs> maybe i hate that question because it's the wrong question the question is what do i need in my agreement to protect my agency not how short can you make it or how long does it have to be there are no rules about how long it has to be it has to be as long as it has to be to make sure your butt is covered that's the deal and i think it come it stems from just the the human nature of somebody going whoo this thing is 13 pages long, man. I'm going to tell you what, too. I mean, that's a sales guy question because sales guys are all about, or account guys and girls, we want to get the deal done. We don't want any drag on the deal. The client, I can't tell you how many calls I've gotten over the years. Oh, uh, yeah. We started um, working with them on Monday, but we don't have our, we don't have an agreement yet with them. So we really kind of need to get this done. All right. So, you know, I, I, under, I understand agencies work very quickly anyway. It's a very viral business. Communications, creativity, marketing, sales dependent on marketing. It's all fast. I, I totally get it. And we try not to be a drag or an obstruction on the process. Um, but, you know, just understand that um, the more on fire something feels to you, the more painful waiting for the solution is going to feel. That's kind of my general rule of thumb. And you know, and in the same vein, that's a total salesperson question to ask is, does it need to be this long? Can we get it done shorter, quicker, faster? Do you want fast or do you want protected? You know, and every agency has a different philosophy about that. And I don't disrespect either. You know, I have my point of view, obviously, as a legal professional, but we're, our firm exists to help our agency clients achieve their business objectives. And so as long as they understand the risks of taking a different approach or a more abbreviated approach to something, 
then it's their decision to make. And, you know, I respect that. So let's say somebody hires you and then you put together this master services agreement and it's 10 pages and it's modular, right? So there's certain things based on instinct or signals that they get during a deal that they might pull out that just don't pertain or that potentially could stall it out. Would that be the best path to go? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're in a position to be the first to push your document across the table, um, you should use your full standard master services agreement that you use at your, as your baseline or your template for every deal that you do. And then you have to wait and see, of course, how the client reacts to it. Um, and then you'll end up with something either a little shorter or a little longer. Understand if you're going to sign the client's agreement, you need to do about 2.5 X the length of a standard master services agreement. If you're going to get the enterprises version of the document and send it, it's not going to be 10 pages long. It's going to be 15 plus exhibit plus exhibit plus. So, you know, don't think you're going to get to a faster result necessarily by just saying, we'll just sign their document. It's faster and they're not going to agree to ours anyway. Um, first, that's not necessarily true. And second, you need to know what your standard agreement says so that you know what you should be pushing back on if you're going to sign the client's agreement. So, you know, I get it. Nobody wants to waste time, money, or energy on this part of the business. Um, it's, it's not fun and it can be painful in some circumstances. It's much less fun and more painful um, to gloss through it or do a bad job at it. I promise you. Yeah, I I'm the a perfect example where I want something one page. Now the, the font size is super small. See what you're talking about is like a legal terms and conditions template that could go along with like a proposal for a really small. That's project. exactly what it is. Yeah. That's, that, that's exactly. Yeah. It's, it's sometimes that's appropriate. Um, and you know, use whatever font size floats your boat, as long as you can read it. I don't have a particular opinion about that, but <laughs> Um, you know, we got it down to three pages, guys. It was 10. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You would be, well, you probably wouldn't be surprised at how many times I've had that conversation with agencies. Can we keep it? I'm looking for something, you know, just five pages. Just five pages. <laughs> Could you take out enough stuff to make it just five pages long? How about no? How about, <laughs> how about change the font if you want, add a little column in the middle so you can double double-sided, you know, but um, I'm there to protect your agency and my team is there to protect your agency, not to um, just, you know, blow through um, the, the process of advising you about how to protect yourself. It's, you know, you, you are in charge of you and of your business. And so you can accept or reject um, that approach. And I respect it either way, but you know, we are very proactive as a firm and I really believe there's a place in the agency world for um, a firm that understands the way that entrepreneurial small and mid-sized agencies work and creates solutions that eliminate drag as much as possible, but um, help them protect themselves. Um, because the work that you do um, and the salaries that you pay are too important to not really um, do your do everything you can to be proactive in that area. So the situations that we've run into working with enterprise clients where they won't sign our agreement and, it, right. and it's been stuck in legal for like three months, right? And then we're continually fighting and pushing it to, to go through and we will end up uh, signing theirs, inserting our clauses and it still drags out for yeah. like another month. Yeah. Um, what are, do you have any good, just, you know, verbal language to socialize that, to just communicate it? How can we get there further, you know, based on trying to protect ourselves? Do you have anything that you could share that would help that maybe? So, I mean, I, I guess a few playbook suggestions about how to handle the conversation. Um, first, I would say it depends upon who you're negotiating with at the enterprise Usually it's not your direct marketing counterpart. Um, typically by the time you've got the MSA in hand and you're trying to bat it back and forth, you're either dealing with procurement or you're dealing directly with legal. If you're dealing with procurement, in my experience, 
they are using the MSA as a tool to extract as much concession out of you financially as possible, because that's that's their role in the company to get the best bargain possible for the work that you do. And they tend to look at you as a commodity um, and they're not only negotiating with you, but um, lots of other service providers. Some enterprises have procurement people who just work with agencies. If you're lucky enough to be working with them, at least they understand how your business works a little bit. But this procurement, it's about money in my experience and financial terms and payment terms. If it's with legal, they are tending to be more focused upon liability, IP ownership, the truly legal consequences of you all working together and the work that you create. Um, and they are, you know, these days also particularly focused on data privacy compliance. Um, they would love the agency to assume just every single legal obligation associated with that, which is impractical. So first of all, know who you're, know who you're negotiating with because that um, can help you better understand the motivation behind the changes they're asking for. Secondly, I think agencies do themselves a favor when they ask the question, help me understand the goal you're trying to achieve here with this provision that we've stricken out or with this provision that you want to add. What is the goal? What is the business goal, the financial goal that you're trying to achieve or the thing you're trying to protect by the language, the way that it's written? Um, Third, I would, and, and that, that I find puts the onus back on them to sort of describe why it's important to them. And then sometimes you can figure out another solution or another place in the agreement to help give them comfort on that point without a provision that's unfair to you, the agency. I would say next, involve as much as you can your marketing counterpart at the client because they're going to be the best thing you have uh, the, the closest thing you have internally um, to an advocate. And I, we have done much better, I think, or I should say negotiations have gone more quickly and felt less painful for our clients, our agency clients, when their marketing counterpart has actually sat in on the conversation. They're not going to want to do it because it's not part of their job technically. Um, and they hate legal stuff. But if you can get them, if they're your advocate and they really want to work with your agency, if you can get them involved in understanding that what legal is asking for is not something that the agency can be comfortable with or what procurement is asking for might not be reasonable for you, they can kind of come up with a business-oriented solution that'll make it harder for their procurement or legal teams to push a point forward. So those are kind of my top line negotiation playbook suggestions for um, having those conversations when you're working off the client's version of a master service agreement. Great tips. I appreciate Thanks. you sharing that. Yeah. So is there anything I haven't covered that the, the world should know? <laughs> um, I think I could probably speak to um, what we see as a couple emerging areas that agencies need to be more um, sensitive to and aware of. One I alluded to before, and that is a increasing um, expectation among clients that um, agencies be responsible for data privacy compliance. Um, our approach to this is to have um, special addenda for master service agreements where you're gonna be handling data. My first suggestion is handle as little data directly as possible in your relationships. Even if you are doing a, a direct response campaign, um, if you can arrange it so that you're not the one pulling the levers and you know that you're just looking at the data after it's aggregated, um, that's the best um, situation. Most of the time that's not possible. And so if it isn't, um, really be careful about what the data privacy compliance obligations in your master service agreements are. Most enterprises are having agencies sign um, special addenda agreements on data privacy in addition to the MSA, and they can be really, really intense. So just understand that that's an emerging issue. And I'm guessing most of the people listening to this have either been exposed to that um, in some way, shape or form. Um, we're seeing an increase for those of you that do um, web development, 
um, and expectations among clients that sites be ADA compliant. Uh, a lot more conversation about that, a lot more conversation about what the contracts between agencies and clients should say about it. My top line observation about that is that there is no federally defined set of rules yet about what ADA compliance really means for a website. There are recognized guidelines, but it's nowhere near settled and we're seeing an increase in litigation by some of these professional plaintiffs who are suing parties um, for having websites that they say are not ADA compliant. So that's an emerging area. And then I would say- You wrote that one up because yeah, that's something we're seeing all the time. And yeah. we actually do ADA work to a certain extent, but yeah, when it's in there, we can't guarantee anything. And now there's yeah. these other shops that are trying to say they guarantee and a guarantee comes with some type of bond or there needs to be some type of monetary backing to that. Right, agreed. But well, and yeah, you need I, my advice, my blanket, you know, sort of point of view, I won't say it's advice because nobody listening here is necessarily my client, but my point of view of it is, is that you're not in a position as an agency to guarantee compliance. You shouldn't be guaranteeing compliance. If you're going to guarantee compliance, you probably need a third party technology partner um, working hand in hand with you to review the site before it goes live to make sure you've done everything humanly possible at the moment the publish button is pushed um, to uh, ensure compliance. Um, so that I would say finally, um, influencer marketing continues to be an evolving and uh, it's an increasingly requested service for agencies because it is increasingly a big part of the marketing mix for most brands. And so really being fluent in what the FTC's requirements and regulations are around influencer marketing, required disclosures, um, the appropriate way to work with influencers to make sure they're following the rules. Uh, we're definitely seeing an uptick um, over the last 18 to 24 months in um, that kind of analysis. So, you know, influencer, ADA compliance, and um, what was the first one that I said? I've forgotten it already. Oh, um, data, data privacy. Yeah. So those yeah. are the three emerging places that agencies need to really, you know, have their, their thumb on the, the dial as well as seek legal protections. Exactly. Yeah. Keep yourselves up to speed on what the industry's trade, what the industry trade associations are saying about it, both four A's on the agency side and ANA on the brand side, because they're talking about it constantly. And that's a, sort of the best place to get an idea of the cutting edge of where, um, you know, client side marketers and agency marketers are on all those areas. So, you know, keep abreast of that information. Um, look at your own agreements regularly to make sure that if the work you're doing touches any of those things that you looked at the language um, in your agreements recently to make sure it's as up to date as it can be. And on the influencer side, I think I, I heard or, or read that they were like trying to unionize or something. <laughs> I don't see how they could. I mean, you, uh, I, I don't have any information about that, yeah. but I think the very nature of an influencer, unless your influencer also happens to be a member of one of the talent guilds, like we've, we've worked out influencer um, deals where um, the influencer is a celebrity and they happen to be a SAG after a member, um, which is a union. So um, we're, you're engaging a celebrity influencer, you're going to have some union compliance things um, to address in your agreements because some of the work that they do in their influencer services for you is subject to um, union regulations. So but that's a very heavy and specific case by case analysis that you have to do. Make sure they get their three meals a day and their eight hours of sleep and all that stuff. Yeah. Well, you got to abide by whatever the union agreement says, and it says funny things about different things you know it's mostly most of the time it's a question of compensation rather than working conditions but yeah but things usually are um, <laughs> now uh, how, how can people get a hold of you thanks yeah well a couple of ways um certainly find me on linkedin i uh, post regularly um at my podcast the innovative agency which is really one that doesn't discuss legal issues, but sort of talks about the industry um, from a, 
uh, an innovation and a what's next point of view. Um, and where John's going to be joining me soon to sort of continue this conversation, part two. We're doing our first crossover. Um, I feel very TV network savvy right now. Um, and then um, feel free to reach out at email if you've got something specific you'd like to talk about. It's Sharon at legalandcreative.com. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sharon. I really appreciate you joining us today. My pleasure, John. Thanks for having me on the show. All right. And then.